and then I'll let you go and then we'll kick off the convo. Sure. Okay, so Tonse, Selena Nitsiga-san, Oce no toe iswe o nukam, wea oce water hen lake eskiagan, egwa nimusam wea oce flying dusk eskiagan, ot egwa nigoe wi munasquiao. So hello, Instagram world. Um, my name is Selena Bowen. Um, I am mixed, so on my mom's side, I'm white settler. Um, and we grew up on the beautiful lands of the Couch and people. And on my dad's side, uh, my Koka, my grandmother is from Waterhen Lake uh, First Nation, and my Masam is from Flying Dust First Nation, which are two um, Cree reserves in northern Saskatchewan on Treaty Six territory. And I currently am coming to you from um, the traditional and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil uh folks. And it's beautiful, and the sun is shining, and I feel so grateful to be um, a guest. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Goi, Delawisi Shaun Jodri, Delawi, Gaspu Wecha, Huigi, Olsitguk. I'm living here in the ancestral territory of my Olnu or Mi'kmaq ancestors. Uh, here in Southwest Nova Scotia, in Gesbogwik, um, specifically in Bear River First Nation, and Olsutguk is our name for the place. And um, I'm also mixed uh, European settler and uh, in Mi'kmaq, and uh, I'm also happy to be here. I just want to give uh, extra thanks and and gratitude, you know, to this land. You're talking about the sunny day, like this land that um, that has uh, taken care of humans since the dawn of humans and taking care of my all new ancestors and thanks to those all new ancestors for welcoming you know the the settlers and and at the very beginning you know the the the, the true meaning of that of that friendship you know is, is what we try to remember and make sure that that's where we're you know where we're headed so i'm so grateful for all of my ancestors and the land and uh, i know that there's a lot of a hardship. I don't want to, you know, go go through the next, you know, few minutes and not acknowledge that there's a lot of hardship even today in our in our territories um, with uh, conciliation, with a lot of um, um, health and you know divisions between community. Um, but hopefully, our conversation about art and land and uh, <laughs> culture um, is is hopefully that's a little bit of good medicine. Yeah. I love that. Yes. Um, mm. Also, we are here on behalf of the incredible Writers Trust Amplified Voices program. So um, it's a program by the Writers Trust to promote books published during the pandemic by um, BIPOC Canadian authors. And the goal of this program was to give or is to give writers who missed out on in-person opportunities to be discovered by readers and it was made possible um in part with the Canadian, the government of canada and you can find out more at writerspress.com slash amplified voices um <laughs> so that's a little spiel about that but i do have to extend uh just so much gratitude to um the writers trust uh for making this space i think you know shalyn i don't know if you can attest to this but certainly uh, Undoing Hours was my like de is, is my debut collection and releasing it during a pandemic meant that I didn't have an opportunity to connect with folks in person and um, get to sort of be in community with with people which sucked honestly <laughs> so yeah so I'm grateful to at least have have this space here um I, we're sideways so i'm like trying to read the comments and i'm like oh yes <laughs> there's like links being posted which is amazing and so fun um yeah so i don't know Jalen, did you have how was your experience releasing a book during the pandemic pandemic yeah well for me it was my third book but second book of poetry mm -hmm. and i and i and i was so oh i can i can just imagine all your excitement with your first book like that like 
being a writer for so long and finally getting your first book out, but the difference between how much energy and in-person activity I gave the first book versus my second book of poetry, I was just, I felt sad for, for it, you know, for, for, for not giving it as much attention as I did the first book. And so, um, but luckily I, you know, I did one virtual, you know, launch, but it just really wasn't the same. And I'm a person who uh, the pandemic has made me uh, be a little bit more comfortable with cameras. <laughs> yeah. Really a person who loves like that in-person energy, like, especially as an oral storyteller and theater person, like that in-person energy. And, and so this book didn't really get that. And so it, I just felt like it just kind of sat on a, a shelf in my house and just, you know, was, was just there and just being patient. And so I'm so thankful to, you know, Amplified Voices to give it a little bit of space. And, oh, no. And Did we lose Shaolin? Oh, there we go. We lost you for a second, but you're back. Okay. I'm so grateful. Yes, yes. Um, um, what? I was just going to jump right in, in, in the, the, the thing about uh, reading, <laughs> reading your lovely book is right away seeing your language, your indigenous language in there is, um, is exactly like one of, one of my, my biggest passions from, you know, for me too, you probably saw the, my language in there too. And so what has, um, what has been your reclaiming your indigenous language journey been like and why i mean i know my answers but why do you put it in your in your art in your your work this way yeah um well okay first of all i'm really excited to turn it over your book because it is so <laughs> beautiful and anyone who does not own this is you're missing out just like in terms of even uh, anyway i'll go on after that um after this but um yeah so learning the hey win was um I think for me, I didn't grow up in community. I grew up with my mom. And so for me, initially, I think language felt um, sort of like a uh, first steps towards reconnecting. Um, and that was really powerful. And I've learned from, I'm so grateful to various teachers and have been learning from various elders and through also different programs that are available um, to learn the Cree language. And I think involving it in my work, I think I really, I've spoken about this a little bit, but I really wanted to be transparent about how messy and hard it is, that it's not this sort of romanticized process and reconnection is, um, at least for me, has also been, you know, it's been really joyful and wonderful, but there's also been moments of frustration and pain and um, that have also been hard and I also just I think it's sort of funny you know like I'll I remember I was in a language um uh class and I said a word wrong like it was the it was just like the yep. pronunciation and the two elders they just started laughing so hard because I had said something like really rude and it was just like moments like that that are really I don't know they're fun and they're joyous and even in my book um in the very first uh poem the plot so far um i use a word that i had looked up just on the cree dictionary online and i later asked um the elder that i was working with i was like oh do you have you heard this word like how do i pronounce it and she kind of looked at me and she was like oh i don't know i actually don't know that word and she was sort of piecing it together and so it's just a reminder i think also you know when we are on these journeys to really um I think it's so beautiful if you have the privilege of learning from um, language speakers because there's so much nuance and it's so, you know, dependent on what community you're in and how you would say the word or what the word particularly means, especially because um, Nehewewewen is so connected to uh, the land, right? So it really depends like where you are. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to be transparent about that, I think. And um, something I had mentioned, but, uh, Emily Riddle, who is amazing, and um, you should all read and follow. Um, she also mentioned to me, or I think I, I can't remember if it was an interview or where, where it was, but she mentioned sort of like intentionally using the language rather than just putting a word in, like mm. only using it when it was sort of, I don't want to say necessary, but only when you couldn't express that in English. And that really has resonated with me. And I've been thinking really deeply about that because I think initially, you know, I wanted to show my learning process and it was a way for me to learn words and to be actively using them um, in my writing. So I don't know, it's something to, uh, that I've been pondering. 
Um, but I'm curious because also you have, it's so beautiful. You did, um, I wanted to point out, oh my gosh, there's just so many poems that I want to nerd out over. Um, but this one, you have a translation. So mm -hmm. you have it written first this way. And then I don't know if this is backwards on the live, but um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, so, um, but I guess I wanted to hear your perspective mm -hmm. and sort of what, um, where you are on your language journey and um, learning. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I'll give you the, um, I'll give you the bittersweet, everybody. Um, so I want us to recognize that there's a, there's a lot of interest in indigenous languages right now. And that's so exciting. Um, <clears throat> the reality is that so many uh, of our elders from Southwest Nova Scotia ended up in the Shibanakadi residential school uh, and just through all of colonization and assimilation in terms of linguistics, we actually have no fluent speaker in my community right now. We have people who are learning or remembering from childhood. Mm. And in the whole region of Southwest Nova Scotia, we have, we have a few fluent speakers. And so it actually takes a lot of active, active, active seeking, searching to try to find those experiences. So not just because I'm not in my home territory, I'm sitting in my home territory seeking, seeking, working, working, working. And it has felt like for two decades, like I'm in a hamster wheel, like I cannot get out of beginner indigenous language, uh, like beginner uh, because there, there hasn't been a lot of resources. Luckily, like you were, even in your, your poetry, I could see that there was like online resources. So mm -hmm. thankfully there's a little bit more resources um, uh, in the language, but also like you were saying that there's dialect differences, difference in orthography, it's just different. You know, there's more people who speak and understand the language than who are writing the, the resources. So for beginner, it's very, very, very difficult, but uh, the more that we are, I think, creating in the language as we're learning, the more that we, um, that we keep trying to help each other up, uplift the language resources, language programming, making sure that there's more and more and more. Uh, so I have lots to, you know, keep, keep talking about for there. But for me, uh, why I write uh, in the language and put it is to, is to keep it alive in my mind and on my tongue and, um, so mostly I do try to use the, the language in, in my art when, when it makes sense to. But once in a while, it's there because luckily, um, maybe uh, that I think of Masusi before I think of Fern. And mm -hmm. that I'm actually a little bit emotional because that has been a very, 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 very long journey to get to that point, you know, that I'm trying to Dasi, think in the language and it um, it takes a lot of passion and um, <laughs> sweat and tears a lot of tears and um, beautifully my teenage daughters um, as teenagers know more of our own language at their age than I did at, at, at that age so all things it's you know that it's the beginning of, of on its way back and our language across Canada was supposed to be one of the ones that wasn't going to last you know <laughs> created your way in the to you know that they they were uh, documented as the, the three biggest you know languages that were possibly going to survive and maybe mine was you know wasn't going to but you know let's prove them wrong and it doesn't take just us and in indigenous artists it takes everybody to say yeah let's learn these languages um, and, and work together on that. Yeah. I well, definitely identified like reading, reading your book, like as you were describing these, these moments, I, I, I could feel, I, I knew, I knew. <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness. Same. Um, I want to first just thank you. Um, Lalalyn. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was talking to one of my friends who's my friend. Um, she was teaching me some words before I came on. Mm -hmm. Um, but yes, it's, um, uh, it's really, I think you hit the, you just, uh, encompassed in words what sometimes is hard to describe in the sense of language is not, it's not, a, it is about the words, but it's, it's about the way that we think that it that you know it's I mean they are 
uh, you can't separate them really. But it, I think that that's really the challenge. Um, that's the biggest challenge of learning a language. And I think, you know, you said that you think of a fern in your language before. That's just so beautiful to me. Like that's the dream really, I think. Um, and yeah, I do think it's sort of that daily like practicing and repeating and um, really understanding that relationship between language and the way that we sort of like see the world. Um, that's so beautiful. But I wanted to share a story about your book because um, I hadn't read it before we were um, joined together for this beautiful live. Um, and it arrived uh, a few days ago in my mailbox and I was having a really, really hard day. I was just not in a good place. And it was late at night and for some reason I was sort of wandering around my apartment and I decided to check the mailbox, which is just right outside, like in the hallway, which is strange. Like, you know, it was like 11 PM, I think, to be honest. And I was just sort of like in my own brain, not feeling good. And I opened it up and there was your book. And I just felt like it came to me exactly in the moment that I needed it. And I had, I opened it up and I was making tea already and I opened it up and I read just the first the first little bit, um, the forest teaches us to entangle ourselves with everything, let nothing be without growth. And I just, I had been messaging a friend and I was like, I think that I was just meant to read this book tonight. And so I like, you know, um, put some candles on and like played piano music and really like romanced myself. And something that really struck me about your book that I feel so grateful for is it just you know, there are, there are, obviously, there is some challenging content in here, like content that's not all like, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it's not beautiful, necessarily, it's reality. Um, but also, it just felt like, with that aside, like, a, like a hug, like a warm hug for me, <laughs> which sounds really cheesy, but I get it. Yeah, I don't know. I just and then yesterday, I was sharing it with some friends, and I read aloud, a few of your poems and we were like tearing up like it was a moment <laughs> um and i just wanted to share that with you and for anyone who i don't know is just looking for comfort and hope and just um like a moment with language that feels really yeah comforting and special highly recommend highly recommend it's like the kind of book you want by your your bed when you're having a hard day and you just pick up and there's just that reminder um yeah so thank you for that i just I, it's hard for me to describe exactly that experience it just felt sort of um yeah just it was like i was meant to read your book at that particular time because it did Aww. i think remind me and reground me in terms of sometimes like why we do what we do and yeah life is so hard and messy sometimes so i just i really thank you you know, it's just a reminder what poetry can do, because sometimes it feels like we're writing into the void. <laughs> yeah. Know. And when I was reading yours, and there was so much that I understood. I mean, there's, there's some that, you know, you had a different life than than me. But you know, some of it, uh, I just caught myself like smiling to myself, because when I was like raised on poetry, there there were some amazing indigenous poets, you know, while while I was <laughs> growing up. <laughs> I sound so old. <laughs> uh, but but there wasn't, you know, there wasn't as much as as today, but more of my reading as a as an avid reader, you know, when I was a teenager in my 20s and, and so on that um, there weren't as many books out there that I really felt like we understood each other, you know, and maybe that's partly what, you know, you were also talking about. And so, you know, this thing when you, when you work with um, other like editors and publishers and, um, you know, maybe like 10 years ago, the question of, well, you know, why do you want to put your language in here? Or this reference is a little bit vague. I don't get it. And you say, oh, well, if you were, you know, if you knew some of our culture or history, that probably would make a little bit more sense to you. And then you have to make the decision do I explain, how much do I explain for people who are not Indigenous? 
And so uh, at some point in my frustration a few years ago, I think I just blurted out in like a meeting because I deal with this, you know, when we're looking at any kind of art form, be it theater or, you know, whatever. And so at some point I just blurted out and I said, but sometimes I just want to make art for us that I don't have to explain everything. And so either you're going to get it or you're not going to get it. And sometimes I'm allowed to not explain everything. And so I felt like reading your book was like that, where it's like we were, yeah, we were sitting in a living room, you know, or around a fire and we were sharing our stories. I was like, yeah, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. So that's what I wanted to share about uh, reading yours. I just got myself like smiling and nodding. And, and I love your use of, of poetry you know, of uh, being able to use a word and like go on to a next image and a next image. And um, I don't know, I just want to ask you something like crafting, like how, yes. how, did, how did you decide all of you have such different forms in mm -hmm. your book? How did you decide to not be consistent, you know, just use different forms? Like how did you, how'd you decide to do that? Yeah. Thank you. That's a great question. Yes, let's let's start nerding out over poetry. I love it. Um, I I think it had to do something with thinking about um, messiness and how to convey that in sort of all of its forms. You know, messiness around heartbreak and messiness around language learning and messiness around sort of undoing uh, colonial mindsets and colonial thinking and approaches to thinking um, about the world. And so, yeah, I think it's sort of, to be honest, um, initially, I think it was just sort of the forms that felt like they were fitting the poem. And then, you know, as they started to come together into a collection, um, it, yeah, it just seemed to work, which was fun. And also stubbornly, at some point I was told like, uh, you know, don't use slashes in your poetry or something. And I was like, I'm going to do that. I just, I feel like there's a lot of like, also like resistance in some of these poems where I'm just like, I was told something was not, you know, you weren't supposed to do it or whatever. And I was like, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> um, just, yeah. And I think that that came with time, to be honest. I think there was a period of time where I was writing and I was really, um, feeling like I was lacking the confidence to do what it was that I wanted to do with poetry. Um, and so, yeah, I, yeah, I guess that's my answer. What about you? Because you stay fairly consistent in your form. Have you, um, was that intentional for this particular book? Yeah, I guess I was thinking about working with editors and publishers and just kind of just sticking to just a regular, um, flow, but yet, um, you know, you didn't capitalize or use a lot of punctuation. And, and that was something, you know, that I really had to decide for my first book and, and my second mm -hmm. book of poetry and kind of decide about that. And I just wanted to, I just wanted it to all feel like it was flowing. And I naturally break a stanza where <clears throat> I feel like I pause longer, not like when I'm hearing myself say these words mm. but, and I'm about to go somewhere, somewhere else with it. And so it's kind of just, yeah, I just kind of stick to it. But I, years ago, you know, I would play with form on the page. And so it was just really fun to see you do that where I actually had to turn the book for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And, and, oh my gosh, you're, if, Honestly, it took me like I'm not a super great texter yet. I just got a smartphone not long ago. And so like I had to it took me a little bit to understand why there was a Y and then a T. I'm like, I don't. What is she <laughs> what is this word? What is this word? <laughs> it's so funny. But um but it's it's your art, you know, this is your voice and, and I just loved your your boldness to say these are my words, this is how I'm I'm sharing my my stories and my you know, what, what I'm feeling in my memories. And yeah, this is making me think about, uh, it's making me think about like the textures of books. Mm -hmm. Um, and especially cause your book is just so beautiful. Um, and I'm thinking of that poem that you have about chiseling down a thought to make it more round. <laughs> and I feel like there's a, like a, like a, 
like a softness in the sort of language that you use. And I think when I was reading it, especially, I'm so curious to know if you, during your writing process, read your poems aloud, because I was reading a lot of your poems aloud to myself and then also to my friends. And yeah, there's such a musicality to the way that you write. And I'm just so curious if you're in your um, writing yeah. room or whatever, <laughs> chatting to yourself. <laughs> yeah, I guess I do because um, I really, I, I have a long history of being an oral storyteller too. Like that was something that I really wanted to help make sure that we had oral storytelling, you know, that there was somebody advocating and out there. And I had a really early long ago background in theater. So I thought, no, I can do this. Like I love, I love stories. So I took that on and, uh, and I, do have a love of, of music like I cut I compose a little bit just you know just at home and so I think probably without even realizing it or meaning to that I really do write as though and then I and then I would say it yeah I would say the lines and like where where where's the rhythm next and how many syllables do I want in a line before the you know, before the next thing but at the same time you look at it and if somebody else reads it they might they might just kind of do their own thing with it, you know, because it's once it's out there in the world, everybody can have their own way of reading. And so I, I had to also understand that, um, uh, yeah, art is art. When you, when you put it out there, it'll, it'll have its own, you know, rhythm with, with people. And, um, but yeah, I do, I do read it out, out loud to myself. Not, not often, but I still, once I do, then I still hear, you know, I hear that tone. Yeah. What about you? Do you do you when you're editing or writing? Yes, I de Yeah, I definitely do. I always sometimes I'll um, tell my roommates I'll be like I'm gonna be um, <laughs> editing, and so you'll probably like hear me talking, but it's just like, <laughs> writing. Um, yeah, I wanted to to ask you because you mentioned being an oral storyteller and sort of like what it means to be. What does it mean to hear the world in? story for you and how does that impact sort of your writing process and when you go to um go to write and and also because you write in so many different genres which is so cool um how how do you decide which sort of you know is this a story for a poem is this a story for um like to tell folks orally or is it a play mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think when when we had met, I think I had said something like, like I'm not really like a visual person. Um, and so people who work with visual arts and crafts like you, like you are a beater. And I, I'm not I mean, I might learn how to do something just for the just for the learning part of it. Um, but I but I I've started to tell people but I, I feel like I, I walk the world hearing story. So <clears throat> what I mean is, um, if I'm, no matter what it is that I'm, I'm doing, if there's the silence around me, or if I'm following my partner through the forest or something, is that uh, I can't help but um, imagine telling that story. How would I explain what I'm seeing and feeling and hearing while following, while following him through the forest? What other story could this be in the future if I wanted to you know, make a film or put this as a piece of poetry or, you know, how else would this fit? And I'm just constantly imagining story. But when I think about it, I've always been that way ever since I was a mm. child. And so that question of, <clears throat> when I do think of, of, of a story or uh, in, in any form, how do I pick the form? I really do by what it's, um, how I can imagine, uh, imagine that. So if I really want it to be, um, like not very long plot, but something that is plot driven. And I really want to um, be close to people. That's an oral story or, or theater. Then there's a breakup of how I make those, those two decisions. But if it's something that is even more, uh, if it has an abstractness to it, or if it's a very short story, or if it's more about a feeling or mm -hmm. like a moment in time, oh, that's poetry. And that, you know, that was, I, I, I was writing poetry, I think, first before, you know, other, other forms, but, um, and yeah, then sometimes I think, no, that should be, you know, that should be a podcast or that should be this or that. But um, I know we don't have a lot of time, but I really wanted to ask you about beating. So um, how much, like, how, uh, how does that influence uh, your writing or how does, uh, like, the back and forth of those different art forms and how do you choose 
to work on what? Yeah, no, I love that. Um, I am very grateful to my uh, friend, Adrian LaRock, who taught me how to do two stitch, um, flat stitch beading, two needle flat stitch beading. Um, but my cookum was also a beater. And so for me, it's been a really wonderful way to sort of um, connect with her and channel her energy to some extent. And for me, I think what I love or what I've also been taught is like to bead always with a good heart. Um, and that it's really, I think more than anything, since I started beading, it's just taught me so much about patience and about time. And I think that that's really beautiful. And I think if I'm translating that to some extent to thinking about writing or storytelling and that sometimes um, story, a story or a poem might take time. It might take, I mean, I've had beating projects that have lasted like oof, six, eight months, you know, and it would also be sometimes I would only pick it up when I felt like, okay, I'm in the, the right place to be this particular piece. Um, and I'm in online school for education right now. So I've actually been able to beat a lot um, while I'm listening in school, which has been also really, really wonderful. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's also really nice. I'll be honest as you know, and I'm sure you can attest to this being sort of a working professional writer. Um, it's really nice also to have creative outlets that aren't necessarily, that are not your job to some extent. Um, and not that I, you know, think about writing as a job, but it is part, it is more career oriented um, mm. in that way. It's not why I started, but, um, mm. and so it's really nice just having something, yeah, something that brings me joy in that way. Um, I guess before we end, is there anything mm -hmm. that you have been doing or that you do that um, is not necessarily your writing that you find brings you a lot of peace? Mm -hmm. Well, I keep going back to just walking in the forest, but, um, but I guess my thing like that, um, that feels like that is when I do music because it's, it's just mm. it's good for me and it's, uh, such good medicine. So I, yeah, I hear you there. That's beautiful. Oh, I hope I get to hear your music Sunday. <laughs> um, well, I feel like we should probably wrap up. Um, yeah. Thank you all the wonderful folks who've been tuning in and I've been like periodically kind of like <laughs> lead sideways. Um, and I'm so grateful for, um, for you as well. And then to like get to, I don't know, chat to you. It's really wonderful. And I think it's exactly right. I think I feel like very connected to your work. Um, and oh, yeah, too. I go buy this book if you don't have it already. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And let's they match even. They're both trust. green. Oh, they're, yes, go buy them both. <laughs> anyway, and thank you to the Writers' Trust. And Fallon, I hope you have the most beautiful rest of your afternoon. Yes, and, you too. Okay. I don't even know how to get off of this thing. Now I'm going to turn it this way. We're going to be. <laughs> all right. Bye, all. <laughs>